Hi guys, it's Sebastian back with another video for you today and I've got a special guest here. It's Gabe Oppenheim. He wrote The Ghost Perfumer and we're going to talk about this book today. You're going to tell me all about it, right? To the degree that you ask about it, yeah, I hope so. Okay, cool. So if you want to find out about The Ghost Perfumer, a really great book that you should be reading, then please stay tuned. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Sebastian and this is Gabe Oppenheim. How are you doing today? Doing well. Tired as usual. Are you, yeah. en are you enjoying Wor World Perfumery Congress? To the degree I've attended it. Yeah? Yeah. Do you like it? Have you been before? No. Uh, also, it was supposed to take place in uh, 2020. Correct. I thought they might do the thing that the Olympics did, where the Tokyo 2020 Olympics were held in 2021, but they still call them Tokyo 2020. Mm -hmm. So I keep looking for signage that this is WPC 2020, but the, they don't seem to be following the same route. No, 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 no. It's yeah. 2022. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about Ghost Perfumer today. This is your first and only book so far? No, I wrote a book about the boxers of Philadelphia called Boxing in Philadelphia. Oh. Which came out in 2014. Okay. So uh, not perfume related whatsoever. No, but if there's someone out there who uh, is interested in both, they should they should maybe look into this. Um, or if you just want to read more of my my writing, that would be nice too. Just if you wanted to write to me and say, hey, we like what you do. Or, okay. And are you passionate about perfumes? Is this yeah. something that you? Is that why you did this book? Yeah, well, uh, sure. Uh, I, I was covering all the fights and uh, they can get very monogamous, not monogamous, they can get monotonous uh, because you sit by a ring and no matter what happens inside that ring, you're still just a sort of bystander. So uh, I started bringing perfumes to various fights in Vegas and LA and Tokyo. Uh, and after a while, a long while, like five years, I asked myself, uh, why am I writing about these fighters uh, instead of maybe the people who make the perfumes? Uh, which was a, really the entire idea that I had. I had no more concept of what was going to be in a book other than I'm going to talk to the world's best perfumers. So I wound up speaking to about 50 of them and various stories emerged and the secret history of Creed and, and Pierre Bourdain kind of then became, of, of all of those stories, maybe the, the juiciest or the one that seemed uh, m most um, important to tackle first. So you did not know about the Pierre Bourdain history before you started interviewing all the perfumers. So when you were interviewing the, the, the perfumers, did you have an idea that you're going to write this specific topic in the book or were you just interviewing perfumers to write a book about perfumes? No, I had a real vague concept that it was going to be the lives of the world's best perfumers. Uh, and the hope was, in interviewing folks, I'd find some maybe common elements or maybe distinct elements that might be fun to contrast uh, within those lives. Maybe follow like, I don't know, a handful of them as they develop fragrances. But I wasn't actually as interested in the fragrance development as I was in their uh, real inner lives. Uh, I wanted to be real near them and see what are they like with their families, what are they like outside of the home. Uh, and I got to meet a few people in person, actually more than a few. I went to the offices of Simrise and Givadon and Fermanish in New York when I started this in 2019 with like two months to go in the year. Mm -hmm. Then COVID hit uh, and everyone was locked down, which made them extremely accessible via Zoom. Okay. But the idea of following them around became impossible for a while. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, as soon as I got vaxxed, uh, I flew to Paris and Dubai and got to spend uh, some quality time with a lot of perfumers, including Pierre. Um, but the original idea was sort of let me get into their lives and do creative nonfiction or literary journalism or new journalism, whatever you want to call it, uh, do that uh, with them or to them. Okay. That last part sounds predatory, but <laughs> just that. That, yeah. Yeah. So when you approached Pierre Bourdon with the, with the fact that you knew the, the history of the fragrances with Creed, was he not like don't come contact me now. Like, was he okay to tell you all the stories? I'm assuming that's what he did, right? He just, he totally just gave you all the stories about the creations of the perfumes. Well, it was the other way around in a way. Oh, okay. Because um, I, I don't remember, I could look it up in my uh, phone, but we turned off our phone so it wouldn't go off during the shoot. I don't remember the first time I wrote to Pierre. I, I remember the first time I heard about him, I was told, uh, I think by Natalie Feistauer, I was told by someone, hey, he retired to Normandy and actually doesn't really still circulate in the perfume crowd. He doesn't really socialize so much uh, in these various events with, with anyone. He's not in Paris. Uh, he's not even in the south of France in Grasse. He's, he's in Normandy. He's in the north. And he wants really no part of this world anymore, which was very intriguing. And I kind of filed it in the back of my mind. 
and shot him a note, but I don't think that first note was responded to. Mm. Uh, I, I think ultimately, I Jean Claude Elena said he could talk to Pierre on my behalf and say that I wasn't a schmuck. Okay. And when Pierre was convinced of that, and I, I don't know how Jean Claude Elena did it, but uh, because he did this for me, I, I bought him a, a Japanese uh, flute, like a, a, a really a nice bamboo flute from Tokyo, which I, I thought he might like. Hmm. And that was sort of 50-50. I don't, he, he used to play uh, the flute, but oh. when he got the gift, he says he, got, he didn't play anymore, which wasn't like a thank you per se. Uh, but I owed him a lot because he convinced Pierre to talk to me. And the way I figured that out was because Pierre one day out of nowhere sent me these handwritten stories about his life. And I think he prefaced it with, Jean-Claude said you're not so bad. And then boom, suddenly after I had been kind of pushing for a while, uh, he gave me his life story, which included all the stuff about Creed that he had done. And then I had to like, fact check that, but it really came from him. Okay, all right. Because I knew, I knew of Pierre Bourdon because of Cool Rose, who I was, which I was a fan of. Cool Water, I wasn't really a fan of. He did do Cool Water, right? He did Cool Water. Yeah. And Cool Water for Women okay. um, in the 90s. Yeah. And also uh, French Lover. He did yeah. Frederick Mall. But I did not know he did Creed Fragrances. So when he told you the stories, was this known by other people as well? Or was it kept secret? Uh, it, because the, the It fragrance... had been kept entirely secret with one exception. Um, and the exception is uh, Luca Turin, the fragrance reviewer in Polymath, who's got his theories about smell. He, um, and also Michael Edwards, the, the, the person who catalogs perfumes in, mm -hmm. in Australia, they had together found some evidence, and I don't remember what, that um, Green Irish Tweed had been done by Pierre Bourdon. Okay. Um, some documentation. And so that, that one was sort of half known. The two of them knew that. And then if other people inquired, I suppose they would have heard. But the rest of it was entirely hidden and secret, and I don't think anyone really had any idea how vast uh, the work Pierre had done for Creed was. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Creed, uh, Creed's Green Irish Tweed is also compared to Cool Water, so That's it makes right. sense that he did both of those. Yeah. Are they, they're, they're a little different, right, in smell? You know? They're a little bit different. Um, his idea, Pierre's, was to take um, elements of gray flannel by Jeffrey Bean and, and Dracar Noir um, and wow. start expanding on the more watery facets of that. And he started in the early 80s. Uh, the first sort of idea that he had to kind of move in this green Irish tweed direction was this submission for a scent called Lancome Sagamore, which he lost and uh, Jean-Louis Suzak won. So, um, which is included here. Yeah. yeah. So when he lost for Sagamore, uh, Olivier Creed went into his office and took the, the, lo the loser from that brief and said, all right, I'm going to make it a fragrance. But when he did that, Pierre didn't give up on this idea that um, there could be some brand new watery thing where you have more dihydromersinol. And so he kept pushing the idea of the thing further. So even though Green Irish Tweed was, was sort of taken by Olivier Creed at one point in the 80s, ideologically, he never stopped kind of working on that scent. Mm -hmm. um, and he tried to send it to Hermes for the Bellamy brief. And he tried to send it to a bunch of people. No one really wanted it until this sort of small brand that's really a cigar maker from Switzerland, that's what Davidoff was originally, gave the okay. And so that was put out as cool oh, water. Okay. Yeah, so the whole idea of that fragrance had been taken from work in the early 80s and developed literally for like half a decade. Okay, wow, wow. You know what I really liked about your book was, because I love history and especially perfume, because I love perfumes and I love history, the whole thing together was amazing, learning about uh, the, the, the struggles Pierre Bourdon went through to, uh, you know, to uh, create perfumes and all the briefs he lost and his challenges with his father and everything. But um, why was this kept hidden? Like, why was it kept a secret? And why does, uh, why do the databases list uh, Olivier Creed and uh, the sun as the perfumers? What, why does that happen? Well, it happens on a macro level because the industry has a real problem um, with attribution. There's this bizarre notion that a perfume brand name, so like for instance, Guerlain or, or you know, not Chanel because Coco Chanel maybe is dead, but uh, there is this idea that the brand name and the perfumer name should be the same. Mm -hmm. this, this notion that there's no such thing as um, a creative director, uh, you know, in, in almost any profession, 
uh, it's not one single person and generally what you see on the front of a package like Snyder's pretzels, I don't really think there's a Snyder, but this notion that the name on the front of the box and perfume has to be the perfumer also is kind of pervasive. And then the other problem in this particular case is Olivier Creed had this bizarre but also maybe somewhat understandable desire to be known and seen as a master perfumer. And so he himself sort of propagated that notion, which was a, a fantasy. Okay. The reality was he tried to insinuate himself into the offices of the world's true master perfumers, including uh, Bernard Elena, Jean-Claude's brother. Bernard did um, Acier Aluminium in 1973 for Creed. Oh, okay. So he, his whole thing was, if I can get into these offices and sort of talk my way into getting a sample, I'll get something from, from a really good perfumer, which made Olivier Creed not a perfumer, but also not a thief. It, it made him actually a really good creative director, and if, like someone whose olfaction uh, was extremely refined because you can go into an office, as you know, and perfumers are working on millions of briefs. They got a lot of different blotters, and not all of those things are going to be great. Even the, the best ones won't be. And uh, I, I think, um, was it Vince Kosinski of Mon, who is one of the heads, I think the head of the American Society of Perfumers, mm -hmm. he estimates that for him, he wins like 7%, I think, of the briefs he enters. Wow. So let's just say 93% are rejected. For Olivier Creek to go into, let's say, a pile of 93% of someone's work and find of those rejections, maybe the most piquant, most interesting, most uh, refined scent, that's a fantastic so achievement. So you've got a talent in doing that. Yeah, so he had a tremendous nose, and if he had only called himself the world's best uh, creative director or a master olfactive uh, sort of person, that would have been completely true, but not a perfumer. So he's never made a perfume in his life. Um, no, not in a sort of sense that you have to learn how to actually formulate. I was told he, he actually couldn't really add up the various columns or like, for instance, um, budgeting. He would always tell uh, people, I just uh, go for the most expensive ingredients. And there are people who probably think Creed doesn't do that anymore. And to be honest, I haven't done a GC on the most recent bottle, so I couldn't say whether they do or they don't. But I do know that originally Olivier Creed used uh, all the most expensive materials uh, I think in part because he loved the idea of luxury, but also in part uh, he, he couldn't keep a fragrance to budget. Uh, when you have fragrance oils, they obviously all cost different amounts, yeah. and there's software to you know, help, but basically you want to keep a fragrance when you're on a brief to a certain cost, otherwise no one will walk into Macy's and buy it. The, so that's part of the, the brief itself. And Olivier was just like not necessarily able to do those calculations, so everything was just the most expensive version of everything. Okay. Uh, which works, because I think that's probably one of the things that snagged people. Uh, yeah, we, they didn't know anything of this backstory, but they've sniffed it and felt, oh, there's something there. Okay. How many perfumes has Pierre Bourdon created for Creed? Oh, man. Well, he stopped, he retired, uh, or semi-retired in the mid-aughts, and then after that, his students started creating. So, so Julian Rask and I did uh, Royal Oud and Creed Pour en Fonts, and... and, and um, I'm a fan of Julian Rask and I. he's created my favorite Creed. So, so I guess he was a, a student of uh, Pierre Bourdon. Yeah, he, he didn't go to like Isipka. He had an untraditional route to perfumery because he was apprenticed himself to Pierre wow. and then really couldn't get picked up by one of the major, ho um, not houses, but uh, multinationals, you know, like a Givaudan or a Fermiche or an IFF. So he created his own company in Dubai at the start of his career. And on the strength of his just sort of hard work, eventually was hired by IFF. Um, but also the same thing with the Christophe, um, Jean-Christophe Hérault was another disciple of Pierre's. I did not know that because I just met him at Exxon's. Yeah. He created a new fragrance for Jacques Fatt. Yeah. Great fragrance. Yeah, it's, created, a, it's, a, it's a vetiver, right? Yeah. yeah. But he created Aventus. Yeah, he created Aventus and, and Olivier again very logically said, okay, well Pierre's retired, that's my secret perfumer, he's got students. Uh, I'll go there and, and take their um, perfumes. All, uh, but Aventus wasn't a rejected perfume. He actually walked into uh, Jean-Christophe Hérault's uh, office with a musk from Fermanish that uh, Olivier was in love with, just oh, um, okay. enthralled. And he said, this musk, it's a perfume in itself. Would you create something with this musk? And Hérault said, yes, if you let me throw in all the ingredients that I'm fond of, um, including Ambroxan and, and some other things. So um, that was the genesis of Aventus, but it was sort of a logical just next step from uh, using Pierre just to use sort of that next generation of his students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go back to the idea of rejections. Are all Creed fragrances 
until the, the, the uh, apprentices started making them, or the students of uh, Pierre Bourdon make them? Were they all rejections? Uh, most of Pierre's were. I, I, I don't want to say all because off the top of my head I'm, I might be missing one. I mean, there have been a lot. But uh, yeah, I was just talking to someone last night about Molassim Imperial, um, which um, he wasn't sure at the time, but I believe that was um, a Jill Sanders Sun fragrance, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, makes sense. That Pierre submitted for. And Silver Mountain Water, which was basically the same time, was um, the original, uh, it was a submission for the original Lo de Se Por Homme oh, wow. um, at Chisedo. At the time, the woman who was the creative director at Chisedo. Um, working on that was was the same person that Pierre had one with uh, for Kuros, uh, Chantal Rose. So Chantal had worked with him on YSL Kuros, and Pierre actually thought, um, well, she's at Shiseido, we sort of see eye to eye, this will definitely work. Um, and he was rejected because they went with the Jacques Cavalier scent, but it mm -hmm. became Silver Mountain Water, and they're both still available on the market, which I think testifies to maybe the enduring uh, merit of each. Okay. Any, anything else you want to say about the book? Because I think it's a very exciting read, and if you're into the idea of uh, perfume history, I think it's a great read. Um, but uh, what else would you like to say before we wrap up this uh, interview? Well, I'm very grateful for the interview. Um, Welcome. Very rarely have I been interviewed by um, Buddy Holly, which is so that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just a glasses reference. Um, no, Sebastian is very kind. No, I, I think there's a peop there are a lot of people out there who think um, Gabe's a, a snark puss. And he likes getting into the industry and just um, sort of being negative about it. But in reality, uh, aside from my tremendous appreciation of the, the creed sense for what they are, um, which is to say formulas that Olivier could tell were good and maybe other people couldn't at the time. That's a good thing, actually. It's a great That's thing. That's an amazing talent. Tremendous. Um, besides an appreciation of, of, of those scents, I think what I appreciate and I hope people can get from the book is that Perfume is a bizarre confluence of a lot of factors, and so the idea that and and the okay and those factors I think themselves are an amazing story. So I, I would love for the perfume world to say, hey, you know it's a great story. Pierre tried to get back with the woman who worked with him on Kuros, but this time she said no, and as a result there was this beautiful metallic scent that nobody maybe got, and Olivier did. And that's maybe as beautiful a story, if not better, than the fake one that was propagated, which was that Olivier was inspired by his days as a skiing champion. Um, to me, that story isn't as good as the real one. It just doesn't, it, there's not as much serendipity. So I think the industry as a whole, and, and maybe it's not my place to prescribe things, but I, I would hope people who come to the book, if they come to the book, leave it with a sense of, Reality and nonfiction is and truth is often much stranger and more interesting than fiction. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, anyway, guys, yeah, this is a great book, and I'm so happy to have finally sat with uh, Gabe to uh, talk about it. If you haven't had a chance to read it, please do. You'll learn a lot. Uh, I love going down the history and learning about uh, such bad luck uh, Pierre Bourdon had with... Uh, well, he also had tremendous luck. I, I think, he did, he did, yeah. I think one of the things that makes him an interesting figure, very sympathetic, but I guess, if, to me anyway, but you could, other people might not agree, is someone who won so much um, still cares so much about ideas. Uh, like the idea that Cool Water didn't somehow fit certain briefs still offends him. He, he actually has no animus at all towards Creed, the company or the man. Uh, his animosity, not, not animosity, his agita really relates to various briefs that he still believes qualitatively he, he met and then should have won and somehow didn't. And so his tremendous caring for these projects, um, that sort of come, it's almost undeniable. In his office, he's got a notebook of every formula he's ever done and every, every like sort of scent description, it's just bulging notebooks. And you're looking at these pages and he's going through them mm. and he sort of gets absorbed in a page and you lose him for a moment. Oh, wow. So he just still cares so much about losses and wins, not because he lost or he won, but because he thought, no, 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 mine was the better idea. So uh, that makes him sympathetic to me. Um, but to be fair, he also won a good deal. So it's not like he had, okay. there, are, there are people who've had much worse fortune I think in he had this more, He had worse luck with his father than making perfumes. Perhaps. Uh, it's tough to have, have a pox a who relationship. worked. Well, his father worked for Parfums Christian Dior and always said this is in a Dior, basically all of his submissions. So when he finally did win a Dior and did La Dolce Vita uh, for women in the 90s, 
it, Pierre told me like the, there was really nothing left for him to achieve after oh, that. Okay. It was sort of an ultimate for him. Oh, cool. Yeah. So where is the, where is the book sold? It, it's available online at that Jeff Bezos store called Amazon. I know not everyone likes to support uh, behemoths, uh, but for a writer, it, it's kind of important to be on there. So that's a push pull in my own conscience, but uh, Amazon. Yeah, and recently I, I t turned a friend on to this book in Italy, and he actually ordered it from Amazon Italy as well, and he got it in a day, and he's been reading about it. But yeah, it's a great read. Go catch it, learn all about it, and then come back and report back here. Uh, any last words? That's it. I'm super thankful for the time. Cool, yeah. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in today to watch this video with uh, Gabe Oppenheim of The Ghost Perfumer. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please list below. Please like this video. Please share it. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And I'll be back with more videos very soon. Have a good one. Goodbye. So before I let Gabe go, I wanted to ask him also, are there other ghost perfumers out there besides Pierre Bourdon for Creed? There are, and uh, I could name several, um, although some of them I can't name because they're off the record to me, and some I can't name because the, the hammer would come down Thor-like uh, <laughs> on your skull. But what I did want to mention was the perfumer Christophe Le Damiel, who used to be at IFF and is independent now, uh, he's been trying to change the industry almost single-handedly. Uh, he has allies, um, the Art and Olfaction Institute in LA, for one. But, uh, and I'm not sure that his approach is the best one, but I wanted to at least bring it up. So there are some tremendously big uh, perfume brands that don't acknowledge the work of people who we could call ghosts. Okay. And the question is, what do you do about that if you want the industry to be more transparent about attribution, maybe more honest if we can even say that? And so Christoph's answer is he's got this sort of code of ethics or uh, pledge that he wants perfume companies to take up. And one of uh, the facets of that he wants uh, perfume uh, brands to have in-house perfumers, each and every one. Okay. And I like that idea. It's interesting because we talked about it at dinner the other night, the fact that uh, Dolce & Gabbana just left Shiseido, who had been producing their perfumes on license for uh, several years. Mm. And now Dolce & Gabbana is going to try to have uh, in-house uh, work done. And I, I guess my question for Christoph, uh, and it's a loving one because I, I love him, is is it realistic, cost efficient? Um, is it the answer to say that every brand sh will, should do that sort of arrangement, an in-house deal? I, I think in-house perfumers can be afforded by the few, like Dior obviously has Francis Carcjohn now and has Francois Demachy, but it's expensive, I think, to be holding a, yeah. a person captive like that to your own place. Um, you know, Alberto Morias, his deal at some of these places is a big one. He doesn't get hired to do so. Yeah. Uh, if, if the watchers, if the viewers of this who are into perfume uh, have ideas on how the industry could reform, um, how attribution could be made more clear, um, perhaps without uh, swearing that each and every place has its own uh, individual house perfumer, I'd be, I'd be curious to read people's ideas. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So when a brand doesn't list the name of a perfumer, does it mean it's a ghost perfumer or does it just not mean that it's just they don't want to credit the perfumer because they didn't do a good job or what? what, what? Well, I, I want to just give some uh, nomenclature credit. Uh, attribution is something I should do also, although in my case it kind of happened backwards. Uh, I had this title for this book, The Ghost Perfumer, in my head for a while. So you just take ghost writer, lop off a yeah. word, replace it. Mm -hmm. But then as... <laughs> Somehow in this ferment of doing research for this book, I came across the fact, and it, Maurice Roussel said this, that at Chanel back in the day, people who worked on perfumes without getting credit uh, were called ghost perfumers. Like, um, that's what they would say among themselves, uh, these folks. So um, I actually, that's the only example of an historical place where they, they use the term itself. But no, I mean, a lot of places want to put forward in front of you ideas uh, about uh, sort of the scent, create, you know, creative stories. But if you were ultimately to press them, let's say like Michael Edwards does for attribution, mm -hmm. they actually may yield the, the answer. So not every brand's gonna come right away and tell you who did what on the, on the label like Frederick Mall does. Uh -huh. Maybe Frederick Malls is the best label because it says just on the top yeah. who the perfumer is, yeah. and Filippo, Synthetic Jungle. But if the label doesn't say that, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily hiding uh, a perfumer. And what I would say is probably exceptionally rare is the case of Creed and Pierre. It's why I was so drawn to it in a way, because Pierre's ghost perfumery 
was uh, m really devoted entirely to, to Creed mm -hmm. and Creed to him. You could say he was the house perfumer. He was. Whereas yeah. at a lot of brands, even if you use someone for a couple cents, you then you use someone else for the next several cents. So even, even if it's a secret, the secret is composed of the history of many different people coming and doing work in house and then skedaddling. Whereas the Pierre Olivier Creed relationship was a, like a 25 year ghost perfumery relationship. Interesting. Yeah. All right, before I totally let you go, ha has Creed gotten upset at you for writing this book? The, the brand or the man or both? Olivier, the son. Neither Olivier nor Orwin has ever contacted me. Uh, I was in touch while I was writing this with people at Creed, um, especially after BlackRock bought the company, the new C-suite in London was a more open and meritocratic place. And I think um, I actually like them a great deal. Oh. Um, the woman who runs the company was doing Penhaligans and Miller Harris uh, before she became the CEO. Hmm. And so, and of course, Pierre retired 15, 17 years ago now. So they inherited this sort of fraught history where the guy who was doing all of the talking as the master perfumer had a perfumer behind him of great repute who had done Kuros and Coolwater. That was the inheritance of the people who work there now. So okay. I think they know that and respect it. It's not as though they were the ones who sort of made that relationship come to fruition. The, the guy who did cashed out for like a billion dollars. So, okay. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Bye.